Hello everyone, thank you very much for joining me again for this new episode in the Software Architecture Fundamental Series. Today, today we continue our discussion on this security epic where in the previous few episodes we discussed OAuth 2, now we will discuss SAML. Uh, which, as you will see, is um, a different protocol for authentication. Um, I will try to describe SAML uh, comparing it with uh, OAuth 2. Uh, I will tell you how it works and then I will show you a coding example using some Java technologies because, of course, that's what I know the best. Um, so with that, I hope that, uh, uh, as uh, always, I will bring you the most important stuff that you will uh, that will help you uh, get started with uh, this and uh, use uh, SAML wherever you need if you need it in your organization. Um, so SAML is quite a, a new technology. Um, nowadays, you will find more often OAuth 2 than SAML have been used, but you still find SAML here and there, so that's why it's still important to discuss it. Uh, by the way, if you are watching the event live, because I see already many of you are connected, you can ask uh, questions in the live uh, chat uh, if you already if you didn't already know that, uh, or you can start discussions. And of course, as usual, I recommend you follow me on LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, with that being said, I have already prepared here uh, my drawing tool where I would like to draw a diagram of visual together with you so that you understand uh, what uh, SAML is and the technologies. And after discussing this subject on the diagram, we will open a key cloak um, uh, that we will use as an identi identity provider in our uh, case today. You will see that the identity provider is in case of SAML what we refer to as authorization server in case of OAuth 2. Uh, and um, we will uh, use uh, one of our own implemented solutions as a service provider, which you will see that in case of SAML is uh, uh, pretty similar to what we refer to as being a resource server in case of OAuth 2. Uh, and uh, with this uh, visual, the explanation and the demonstration, again, I think we will cover the most important uh, basics uh, of uh, SAML and um, again of this uh, important subject from my point of view to any software developer or um, architect. Um, we will only discuss it uh, mostly from the architectural point of view, even though I'm going in this lesson to show you an implementation uh, of um, a service provider that uses SAML. Uh, I will work with uh, Java technology because that's what I know the best. Uh, I will, however, refer to everything from um, mostly uh, an architectural perspective, so I don't want you to understand that what I'm showing you is only applicable uh, to uh, Java technology or uh, to Java in general. This is still uh, our software architecture fundamental series and we are discussing stuff that you can apply with uh, uh, almost any kind of technologies out there with Python, JavaScript, C Sharp and so on. Um, so let me show you what SAML is first in terms of uh, a sequence diagram and discuss what is uh, it used for and how is it different from OAuth 2 because you might find it pretty similar but it has some differences as well. One of the main differences being most likely the fact that the request and the response responses in case of uh, SAML are XML based. So um, um, in case of um, using OAuth 2, that's actually more of a specification. And um, you know that we might use different tokens. We can use tokens that are opaque. We can use tokens that are non-opaque, like, like the JWT. Usually the JWT, which is a non-opaque token, is some, one of the most used approaches. And that's a JSON basically encoded JSON information base64 encoded in the end uh, as we discussed in the previous episode. So in case you missed them and or you want to remember, you can always go back and review the previous episodes to um, get more details about OAuth because I think we discussed quite some uh, some uh, details about OAuth already. But in case of SAML, the requests and the response as you will see, they are 
XML based. So that's one of the main differences. Uh, now, before starting to work on the diagram together, let's try to figure out what is SAML, why do we use it? Um, now, I don't want to get into describing something before telling you what you use it for because yeah, that's one of the maybe the most important rules of teaching is that you should never uh, discuss something before you tell uh, your audience what is it used for. Like imagine me telling you um, what a car looks like in the inside uh, without telling you first how why, why would you use a car. The same here. So um, in case of SAML, we uh, have this situation and I, I will take the most common one which uh, uh, occurs to me and to my colleagues. Uh, for example, in my organization where I'm working, I have to use a lot of different softwares that are provided by several third parties. For example, I use Jira to, um, uh, the, for the task management. Uh, I, will, I use uh, some other Atlassian pro products like Confluence. Um, I use maybe uh, a Jenkins uh, that is configured uh, where I monitor my pipelines. Uh, I use different kind of software for, from different providers. And there is, of course, this problem that um, I, I don't want to need to have different credentials for any of these. Uh, and I don't want to have to every time log in to any of these when I use them. So I, I would really like that when I start any of these third party softwares that I use as an employee of my organization uh, to have to log in only once and then potentially uh, use that login to any other third party. Uh, so that's the main target of using SAML is to be able to log in once, access any kind of third party software then by only using your organization credentials or whatever, let's call them the all unique set of credentials. So you don't want to have different uh, logins and you don't want to have different credentials. So that's one of the purposes for which you can also use OAuth2. Uh, but prior to OAuth 2, you have SAML, uh, which SAML is also now at the second version, which we will discuss. And uh, as you will see, which doesn't rely on tokens, but uh, keeps the user uh, management on the server session side, which is a second big difference. The first big difference uh, that I mentioned being the fact that the communication is exchanged in an XML formatting. So what I prepared here for you is the user, is the browser, that's clearly what they are, I won't uh, tag them. But then the, 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 the last two on my diagram, the first server here, uh, is what I will call the service provider in SAML terminology. Maybe it's better that I, I write actually we are discussing SAML too here, just to make sure that if one of you logged in um, access the video later, you know what we are talking about now. And the second one is what we call identity provider. So identity here. And you will very often find this referred to is as IDP written like this. Uh, and I would like again to even even if in case of SAML, you will always find them to be referred this way as service provider and identity provider. It always helped me uh, thinking about this uh, and uh, the OAuth2 terminology, making some kind of an equivalence between them because uh, it's easier to just compare something you just now learn with something you know, and that might help you as well. And that's why I would like you to consider the service provider as being uh, the resource server. It's basically uh, the third party application, one of the third party applications in your organization that you want to access without having a special login. While the identity provider is uh, very similar to what we've called the authorization server prior to this when we have discussed about two in the previous episodes. And this is that um, system 
giving you the users, uh, the clients and uh, the possibility to authenticate uh, these entities. So uh, the authentication will be done at the identity provider side same as what we've called authorization server prior to our discussion when we've been discussing about two but what you want is actually to access services in one or more service providers so again in my organization i'm using gyra and i'm using jenkins and i want to uh, be able to access both without having to log in in both and we have without having to keep different credentials and i'm pretty sure you might have seen the same in your case for example if you are already working i'm, I'm quite sure that most organizations today uh, have their employees working with several different third-party softwares for different reasons and you don't uh, log in in uh, each and any of them. Um, if you don't actually, if you are not already working in an organization, just imagine you are an employee and you have to work with different software and you don't want to log in in, in all of them. It's like you would like to access your Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter and GitHub with only one set of credentials. Of course, that's not possible, but it was just an analogy to make it uh, uh, to, to make it easier to understand for you. So in case that would have been possible to access Facebook, uh, uh, Instagram, uh, LinkedIn and Twitter with the same set of credentials, that would mean both uh, all of these uh, social networks would have been service providers and they would have all relied on an identity provider that would have kept the uh, management of their users uh, this again doesn't happen, but that that's an analogy for those of you who might not be uh, already employed and working uh, with uh, uh, software in an organization. And maybe maybe it's more difficult for you otherwise to understand and to, to visualize this. So the purpose is don't allow one uh, have to log in several times and with several credentials in different places, give them the possibility to access their services by using only one set of credentials. So you probably know what happens in this case, uh, just you or me or whoever you want uh, accessing in this case, uh, one of the services, say this is Jira, in my case, or Jenkins. Okay, and, and I have my own credentials in my organization. So that's what I want to use to access Jira. So let's assume I didn't uh, log in already. So I'm just going to access any page of the Jira where I want to manage my tasks. Uh, and of course, being that I'm not already logged in, so the, the Jira will, will basically try to uh, access the service provider, but the service provider will tell the browser back, well, uh, you uh, are not uh, authorized because I don't recognize who you are. So instead, uh, I redirect you. Uh, please tell the user, it, it, it tells the user, it, it tells the browser to tell the user, please go on and tell the user they first need to uh, authenticate at the identity provider. So that actually means that the service provider needs to know who is the identity provider. And that's something you will see later in my demonstration when you will basically, uh, where we will basically work with Keycloak and you, you will see that uh, the service provider we've implemented uh, knows some information, some details about the identity provider, which in my case will be Keycloak as I've used also in the previous episodes when I demonstrated uh, something similar with OAuth2. So the service provider redirects the bro browser, redirects the user actually telling them, please go and log in at the identity provider side. And when it redirects it to the, to the identity provider, it also sends what we call a SAML request. And you, you will be able to see this request in our demonstration. So let's put it here. So say SAML request, which is basically the request of the service provider to the identity provider sent through 
the browser so the browser basically is the one redirecting I, I draw here the arrow from the user directly just for you to remember that the user will uh, will log in in the identity provider page same as it was in the authorization code grant type when we were discussing OAuth 2. I hope that many of you uh, remember our discussion and if you don't remember rem uh, you can anytime go back and review those episodes um, they are there for you and they will stay forever there for free uh, so the SAML request tells the browser redirect the user with this request so the request basically will somehow go here uh, when the the user will be um, uh, will be redirected to the page uh, and uh, the, the SAML request goes to the identity provider. The user logs into, ident into the identity provider and the result, considering of course uh, the, the authentication is valid, so the, the user um, correctly filled in their credentials, then the identity provider redirects again the, in the browser the user to the service provider so this is a this is a second redirect coming this time from the identity provider so maybe it's better if we make these arrows a little bit different so that you know it's not a response it's a redirect okay it redirects in the browser and then it redirects again in the browser here sending what we call the saml response a SAML response, I think you already guessed what it contains. It contains the needed details about the identity of the user. So now, when the SAML response is sent back as a consequence of a valid authentication, so this is the SAML response, request is from the service provider to the identity provider the response is the other way around when the identity provider responds response to 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 the service provider everything happening through the browser so everything happens through redirects of the browser because otherwise it would be impossible for these two to communicate at the server side they are in totally different regions they don't know each other so everything happens through redirects in the browser so the user tries to access it it's redirected to the identity provider fills in the uh, correct credentials and then it's redirected with a saml response uh, to the service provider back so finally with all this being said it means that I now can access my service so the the response in the redirects go back and now the service provider has uh, my identity and it means that I can access so this is the service provider and I, I wrote here Jira on on the browser but actually I, I should have maybe uh, written something like this so both the browser and the backend the backend is the service provider that needs um, my um, that, that, that needs basically my uh, identity so I think it's better if we actually refer to it like this this is Jira and access it through through the browser okay um, and of course I've just written Jira here because uh, I guess that if uh, some of you and most of you probably already work they might have already used this and in most cases it happens that it uses SAML to log in uh, but in case you don't know what that is it's only some software so it's just some software you need to use some software you need to use okay so in case you don't know what that is and that's basically it the the only now thing is that uh, if I'm going to uh, again access a different software or the same one but even a different one say I'm now <clears throat> going to access Jenkins so I'm just repeating the same flow the difference is that if I'm repeating the same flow considering the identity provider didn't uh, already end the session 
because now the identity provider keeps track of the session and keeps track of the fact that I have logged in. So uh, in case the identity didn't uh, pass the, the amount of time for the session to expire, uh, in this case, uh, this step where I do have to authenticate again doesn't exist anymore. So uh, what will basically happen is that on the second request, on the same service provider or a different one, uh, the steps will happen again. So uh, I will have, I will be redirected uh, to the identity provider, uh, the identity provider, the identity provider um, receives the, the request uh, and uh, then uh, what, what will be different the second time is that the identity provider already knows me. So when, uh, when the identity provider will receive the request, uh, this is what will happen. So instantaneously it will send the response just because uh, I'm already known, I have already logged in previously. So that's why this is called a single sign on because now I only have to sign on once if I, uh, after signing in uh, for one of my service providers, I go to a second one, then I don't have to fill again my credentials and re be authenticated again just because my session is still alive on the identity provider side. So it will be used and it will automatically redirect me to, to Jenkins or whatever other software I'm using. So th this is how SAML works uh, from the top of the mountain on a sequence diagram. And it's not just uh, uh, that big deal, it's quite a simple flow. Uh, the only thing I would like to mention above what I have already said is that the request and the response need to be signed. So remember, uh, when we discuss OAuth 2, you know that we have uh, discussed a lot about the tokens being signed. And I've told you that you always, when using non-opaque tokens, because they contain information that can be exchanged, um, then the tokens need to be, um, uh, to be assigned. Otherwise, someone in between can change the information if they are not signed and nobody can observe. If they are signed, then the signature won't match anymore. And yeah, that's why, why we do sign the information while it is in transit, as we discussed in one of our previous episodes at the very beginning. So can we say single sign-on can be managed effectively with uh, SAML then OAuth 2? No, I would say that a single sign-on can be managed effectively with both SAML and OAuth 2, just that when you will manage it with SAML, you will keep the session at the server side, while when you manage it with OAuth 2, then you have the tokens which are managed on the uh, client side. So remember, in this case, um, for example, in case of, um, of an OAuth 2, uh, if I want to uh, use the token, the token is something that uh, the client uh, has to store and use. In this case, as you can see here, there is no persisted information on the client side. So uh, the SAML request and the response, they just go on the fly. You, you don't need your client to manage some information. So that's maybe the biggest difference when concerning a comparison between SAML and the OAuth 2. You can say that in case of OAuth 2, the identity uh, is proved by the client through a token, while in case of SAML, the identity is always stored and managed by the identity provider on the, on the uh, server side. And yeah, I hope that this answers your questions. Uh, it's true that you might get rid of some signatures on, on the request. You will see immediately that uh, in the application I've implemented prior to our episode for you, and I'm going now just after, after this, I, I will open my IntelliJ and the Keycloak and I will show you the code. Uh, you will see that I skipped the signature just because I wanted to make the code uh, simpler because I don't, don't want in this stream to discuss details about implementing stuff with Java being that is more a software architecture uh, oriented stream than a Java uh, oriented stream. Uh, so um, um, 
Yeah, with that being said, I think it will be even more clear if I'm uh, already going to open my um, administration console of the Keycloak. Hope my oh my uh, session did expire actually, so I have to log in again. Uh, and you know that we have already used Keycloak in one of the previous episodes because it's open source and you can. It's quite quite a piece of a of a jewelry. This Keycloak is from. I'm not an infrastructure expert, but uh, I like the fact that you can do a lot of things out of the box and I, I don't know all the details about Keycloak being that's not really my my thing but I, I've used it quite in some cases and I, I like this uh, this piece of software is uh, one of the uh, one, one of the, the uh, apps I maybe um, uh, like the most in what concerns uh, the security implementations is because it allows you to implement an authorization server or identity provider and it has these kinds of feature where you can do that with OpenID which is basically as we discussed in a previous episode the protocol over OAuth 2 but you can use SAML as well as we will, we will use today and you can manage your clients roles you can even use uh, user federation with LDAP and so on so it's quite uh, uh, some um, powerful tool uh, Keycloak today we will use it to implement an identity provider with SAML uh, and we will have uh, a service provider implemented by us with Java and Spring and Spring Security. Um, again, why Java Spring and Spring Security? Because that's, my, I can say, the technologies, maybe the only technologies I really know. I'm not, um, I'm not really... Um, a full stack developer so I'm, I'm just a java developer um, but if you click like you know if you um, see the previous episodes i've shown you that you can access the um, the uh, endpoint that the discovery endpoint of open id connect through this link the sim something similar you actually have with saml where you can access this identity provider metadata uh, by clicking the link in keycloak uh, and here you will one of the of course first things you will observe is that uh, we have everything represented in XML because uh, SAML itself as I said at the beginning of our episode is XML based and here you will find uh, the things that you uh, basically the things that you need to know when configuring your service provider so for example one of the things is does this um, authorization, oh, sorry, not, not uh, identity provider. I'm, I'm always tempted to say authorization server because I've actually worked a lot more with um, uh, OAuth than SAML. But is this identity provider um, uh, need, does it need the, the request to be signed? This is a true, which means this identity provider will, will actually reject the request if it's not signed. What is the use of a browser certificate in SAML or SSO? These certificates are installed by organization browsers. So let me show you what, what it is now because you see here it's a certificate and you will most likely understand it but hopefully you will understand it uh, from my explanation when I'm, when I'm done with it. So um, uh, yeah, I was at, at the signature. Basically, this is the default configuration. I'm, I made myself a configuration here that is uh, a little bit um, a little bit um, say lighter uh, in terms of the fact that I made it um, not validate the signature just to make my implementation easier because I didn't want to uh, have a very large configuration here since it's not the purpose of the stream so I as I will show you we will basically not really use uh, this um, uh, default configuration of the Keycloak. Uh, I have some custom configuration I defined here that I will explain. But uh, meanwhile, let's go through the descriptor because what I want you to understand before uh, is which are the most important um, attributes in the descriptor that you should be aware of when configuring your um, uh, service provider. So one of them is uh, do we need or not the request to be signed? So if this is configured to true, it means that uh, wh whatever um, whatever 
request not signed, a service provider will send, it will not be recognized by the identity provider. And this is basically the way it should be. So generally, don't take my example now here, which is only didactical for you to, to have a complete flow. And I made it very simpler for that. In a real world scenario, always configure uh, a, a signature to be to be done and that's where I'm answering your question about the certificate so the certificate is basically used to sign to sign the request so uh, it's basically uh, it needs a private key the service but it needs a private key it will use that private key with a certificate associated to sign the request so that when the uh, identity provider receives it it compares that signature with trying to to validate it with a public key that you configure on its side and uh, it validates that the request is indeed correctly done uh, it's, it's indeed a request that came from the correct client otherwise uh, the identity provider uh, can't know if uh, the request is uh, um, is one that that really came from the valid from from the valid client, and uh, you uh, have a vulnerability because uh, it's possible that someone goes in between and changes the request. So that's why it's really really mandatory that in a real world scenario you do sign the request and the response. So if identity is managed at the server side, then how the service provider will come to know that the user is authenticated since every request is stateless. So basically, uh, when, uh, when the um, identity provider authenticates, the user is sends the SAML response and then the SAML response gets to the server. So the server side now has to keep this on its session as well. So unlike in the case of OAuth 2, where you had a completely stateless process and the client had to send a token uh, every time, in case of SAML, uh, you have everything on the server side and the servers are um, basically responsible for managing the session of the client. Uh, what do we still have here? So uh, what you still have here, this is the mandatory certificate that uh, represents the public key that can be used by the service provider to validate the response. So what happens here is that the uh, identity provider when sending, actually before sending the response, of course, will sign this response with a private key. This certificate is the public key that a service provider can use to prove that the response came from the identity provider. Uh, if we wouldn't have the response signed, then of course, again, like in the case of the request, it would be possible that the response is changed uh, in transit while in transit. And then, of course, that would mean that someone could, for example, interfere with the identity of the, um, of the user. And you see that the request, basically, you can, it's not recommended, I never recommend you that, but you actually can have the request unsigned. Because uh, in that case, uh, well, it's at least not the the identity that can be uh, that that can be altered, but the response can never be unsigned because uh, you have the identity there in the response. So that would actually mean that if you really have this unsigned, then someone would be able to uh, who is say uh, you have the roles uh, manager and admin and admin is more powerful than manager then uh, in the response you will have uh, the fact that user x who authenticated is a manager and not an admin and if you don't have it signed then someone can uh, take the data while in transit and put admin instead of manager and if the, the, the response is not signed, then, then no one would be able to see that some, something have been incorrectly altered there. So that's why the response always needs to be. Again, my recommendation is always both of the request and the response should be signed. So uh, 
just as an idea uh, of the theory here, but the practice is that you always should assign both of them. Uh, now, and you basically have uh, different possibilities to, um, uh, for, for the URLs that uh, the uh, service provider needs to redirect the user to. And you find these locations as well here uh, to, for both. This is the logout. How, how can the user be redirected to logout? So imagine you are, I'm still using my service provider. So I don't want to know that I have to go to a specific other software to log out. So somehow the service provider should know how to redirect the user to the identity provider. Because if you take a look on the diagram, you will observe that the user is unaware of the existence of an identity provider. So the user, in theory, only needs to use Jira, Jenkins, whatever other software. But they have no idea this identity provider exists. So the user is totally and should remain totally unaware of the identity provider. It should be totally transparent for the user that this software exists that authenticates it. So neither for logging in or for logging out, the user needs to know to access a specific page. Everything should happen through the service provider. So that's why here you have two kinds of um, of URLs, the one that uh, would be used for logged out. So that's the one uh, where the user would be redirected by the service uh, provider to log out. So close the session on the identity provider. But of course, the login itself, so the sign in itself. So we have the two URLs, the one for signing in and the one for logging, for signing out, for logging out. And now you will recognize all of this information in the service provider that I have implemented myself. So I, um, I already implemented this. It's a very small application um, and I created it before the, the episode because I didn't want to spend the time with this now, uh, especially because I don't, uh, to be honest with you, I don't know these configurations by heart uh, since uh, SAML uh, implementations in Spring Security actually changed quite often in the uh, near uh, past. Uh, so um, uh, I, I have already created the, the application that I will explain it to you line by line and then we will try it so you will see the results. So uh, first of all, I want you to know that this is only a very simple web application with an endpoint hello and when you access the endpoint being authenticated, you will get uh, back with uh, hello. So you, you will get back, back the, the, um, the result uh, in the page, the word hello, that's everything we send to the browser. Whatever we want to see is that we are or not allowed to access this page. Why? Because in the project configuration, you will observe that one of the things I've written is that all the requests on this application are authenticated. Uh, if you know a bit of Spring Security, it will be pretty easy for you to understand this code. If you don't have yet some details on Spring Security, you might still understand the very um, top of the mountain stuff uh, of this implementation. Uh, if you are a developer willing to learn Spring Security, then to understand this lesson, I do recommend you prior to this, uh, go to my Spring Security uh, stream uh, of episodes on this channel and watch that one first, because otherwise you might find this difficult to digest. So, but, but for those of you who maybe have already some idea of Spring Security, uh, you will note that this line here uh, simply says that you can't access a page unless you are authenticated. Uh, and you see that I add this configuration as a security filter chain uh, being in the context, in the spring context, which is basically an alternative to extending, to extending web security configurer adapter and overriding the configure method of HTTP security as a parameter. So um, you 
some of you uh, who know Spring Security might be more aware of extending the Web Security Configurer adapter, uh, but um, lately we are basically using more the bin approach because uh, we don't have to extend a separate class, so that's why this is better theoretically and you can read an entire article on my blog about it so for those of you who are not aware i also have a blog um, find my blog read the article about the difference between using a security filter chain bean um, and extending the web security configurer adapter class then the second thing you will notice is that what i've done here this is a dsl method uh, that tells my application that I'm going to use SAML2 for the login. So I'm just telling you as a comparison the most known DSL method, it's HTTP basic. So if you have used uh, at least once Spring Security and uh, configured uh, endpoint authentication, I'm pretty sure you know what HTTP basic or form login are. So the same as we have the DSL method name HTTP basic or form login, Spring Security uh, lately offer, uh, offers us this DSL method that's called SAML2 login and which allows us to configure, of course, as the name suggests, the login through SAML2. Link, link to my blog, I guess you, you need. So, okay, let me go to a browser for that and it's pretty easy just that i'm not sure why it's not writing so this is this is my my website you you might want to check it because here i'm also sharing the next events where i'm speaking like conferences and you might want to to follow my follow me on twitter and linkedin and uh, follow the blog as well because when I'm speaking at conferences, I'm usually also sharing books or vouchers. So you might be interested. And here you have the blog as well. So, and here is the article I was talking about actually, about uh, the difference between using uh, Web Security Configure Adapter and the Bean. Um, cool. Um, yeah, and going back actually, so where, where, where was I? Was discussing this uh, IntelliJ stuff. So um, the, the same uh, we have again from Spring Security, we have the SAML2 login and the SAML2 login allows you to specify configuration to make this a uh, service provider. So here we have C, relying party registration repository. Uh, this method allows us to configure something that is called a relying party registration repository. And as the name suggests, it ends with repository. You might be aware that the terminology ending with repository, it's some object offering you access to some kind of information persisted somewhere. Now, usually you would extend this interface, you would implement this interface uh, and take this information from somewhere else, like uh, from a database. In my example here, because I don't want to make it overwhelming, I used something that's called an in-memory relying party registration repository implementation, which as the name suggests, it simply allows me to put in memory the details. Uh, and uh, that's something you would only use, of course, for examples or for proof of concepts, uh, like in my case here, but it allows me in 10 lines of code to configure everything I need to make my application work with SAML2 and Kicklock. So what you will see here is that I, I have this kind of, I, I have uh, uh, offered first of all a unique registration ID here that was at my choice. And then you will see here that I say I want the request not to be signed because if I wouldn't have said that, I would have needed to configure as well what's called a signature credential. So you have another method here called encryption x509 credentials. So this encryption x509 credentials is um, uh, a method that allows you to configure the, the key used uh, by the service provider to sign the request. Now, in my case for this demonstration, because I knew I don't have a lot of time to make it faster, 
I just uh, made my requests unsigned. And because I made my requests unsigned, I also had to make sure here that on the key cloak side, uh, I allowed this to happen. So I, I simply made sure that it's not validating any signature because otherwise, if I would have said that the, the signature should be validated, it's also asking me for the certificate. So it's similarly, like I, I configure a certificate to validate the response, the key cloak, key cloak with the identity provider would need my certificate, my public certificate to validate the request. So I just simplified it by turning it off. But in a real world scenario, you would have, uh, you would actually need this. In uh, in real registration ID given to you by identity server, no, not actually. You actually uh, just uh, need to identify it somehow. So uh, uh, and of course that that maybe that's the question, and I didn't correctly understand it. That should uh, at at the identity provider that should be uh, configured as a client. So in my case. Uh, the example one is basically this one here. So I, I configured this client here called example one. And this is basically also where I, I can configure, um, for example, if I only want to allow different, different valid redirect URIs, so I can, I can do the stuff here. I, I will, I will try to show you immediately. But yes, so that if that was the question, yes, basically this is the registration ID, which in my case at the identity provider side, it becomes a client. For in Spring Security, Spring Security Action, thank you very much. So yeah, Spring Security Action is actually the book I wrote, but uh, I would have to disappoint you. I have no chapter about SAML because I actually managed to somehow uh, I, I had planned 450 pages and I wrote 560 pages and the editors didn't allow me to write more because if it was on my choice, I would have basically wrote more than 700 pages with everything that I wanted to write. So that's why Samuel isn't there. But uh, so I had to take it out being um, less in being a, um, the not that much in interest uh, for, for the audience uh, like co oh, to. But yeah, if, if uh, uh, you need it, then I will basically share with you my code here and that's what, whatever you need. Uh, so yeah, th that's, that's why I said here uh, that I don't want the authentication request to be signed. And that's why here I only have this verification X, uh, X509 credentials. This is, this is the key that will be used by the service provider to validate the response. So mind that you can make the request unsigned, but remember what I've told you earlier, you can't make the response unsigned. So the response will be signed by Keycloak and you will have to configure the public key and validate it. So that's why I configured here. If you go down below, you will see this method does nothing else than simply returning the certificate made from string as an instance of this SAML 2x09 credential, which is the object expected by Spring Security. But this is basically what you see here, this MIICM blah, 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 blah. This is actually what I've copy pasted from here. Is this one, MIYCMZ blah, 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 blah. So this is basically what where, where I took this certificate from. So I, I took the public key from the uh, identity provider side so that my service provider can validate the response because the response will be signed and in order to validate it, you need this, this key. And that's why in my code, you see, I got this key, I put it as my uh, Spring Security implementation expects it as a SAML to X059 uh, credential object and then I configured this one using the verification X509 credentials method. Uh, and then I configured the entity ID, which is basically identifying the, ident the identity provider. You find it here. This is the entity ID, very easy. So you get it from, from your identity provider. Any identity provider has the identity ID. Um, and then uh, the single sign-on service location, which equals to the login URL, the login URL, which you also should find in the authorization server side, so this one here. 
is the login URL. So you have the login URL and the logout URL. And of course, I can configure the logout URL as well, but I didn't need it, so I skipped that. And now that I have this, all this uh, information in my relying party registration object, my in-memory uh, relying party registration repository simply allows me to um, provide it like this. But remember, in a real-world scenario, so you would actually implement this interface and take all this information from a database. It's not, it's not like something reliable to put in the code right, directly. This is only something for a, for a short demonstration. But in a real-world example, then you do need to, uh, to store this in a database, same as you do for the client credentials, for example, as discussed for the OAuth 2. And basically that's it. So uh, that's the minimum you need. So of course, above this, you would you it's practically you would need also to sign the request. So that means you would basically need to configure a private key and the, and the key the public key and the credential and configure both of them with the encryption X509 here and configure the public certificate there on the key cloak side but I skipped that to make the example uh, minimal. So um, I'm running now the example, as you know, as you can see, and uh, I, uh, my key cloak uh, runs on port 8080. I'm not sure if you can see that here, but I, um, I'm, okay, here it is. So you can see that a key cloak is running on port 8080. So that's why I had to move my uh, um, application on port 9090 because definitely, as you already know, you can't open the same port on the same machine. So that's why now what I'm going to do is I'm going to say localhost 9090 slash hello. So I try to access my endpoint and what will happen, you've very fast seen a redirect to Keycloak and then, then you've seen me being redirected back if you are asking me why you don't, why didn't I see the login is because I'm already logged in into Keycloak. So Keycloak already manages my session. So uh, it already found me and as discussed on the diagram prior to that. So when you secondly uh, access it, you don't need to fill again your credentials if you are already logged in. So that was my case. And maybe we can do something like this. Let's see if we can see in the networking tab something. I will try to access it again. Um, so uh, preserve log maybe. So no, it, it doesn't actually want me to, or may, maybe my Spring Security, I think now, am I redirected? No, I'm, I'm not redirected anymore. So maybe, maybe I can do something like that. I can refresh. I can restart the app because now I already have it in my session. So I already, I already created a session on my application. That's why it doesn't redirect me anymore to Keycloak. Um, it already created the session. It already um, received the SAML response and everything. So let's, uh, let's try to restart it. See if we can see something in the networking um, tab of the browser as well. My expectation is that uh, we should see that redirect that it it could have been clearly seen with the bare eye. So you, you've seen it the first time that the, the key cloak was accessed and then it redirected me back. Uh, but I think we should be able to see it um, this way. Yeah, exactly. It's not that it cached. It, it, actually, it actually created the sessions, the, the server side session. That's what it happens when, when you, you have um, an application that uh, uses um, a SAML. So it doesn't have to go back again and again because somebody was actually even asking me earlier, uh, how does it know? Because it simply stores it in the session side. So that's how it knows. So maybe I can do something like this. Ah, now you can see it. Okay. So you can, you can see it now. So uh, to, to access hello, first of all, I have been redirected to uh, localhost 8080, which is Keycloak. Oath Realms Master Protocol SAML. So what is that? If you go back to our application, you will see that is basically the login URL. And my application automatically created the SAML request. So you see the SAML request encoded here, uh, sent as a query parameter. So then being that I have, I'm already logged in Keycloak, 
uh, I have uh, Keycloak uh, redirected me back with the response. So some, somewhere here, you should be able to see that I got the response back. So I, I, don't, I don't see it, but I promise you I got the response back somehow. Uh, and yeah, it's only the, the uh, application. But, but in between, we should have something with the response anyway. Yeah. So yeah, this is the redirect. Maybe it's on the redirect, the response. That's why I don't see it. Ah, okay, summer response, yeah, exactly. So it wasn't on the uh, effectively on the resource because the resource comes after the redirect. So first I've been first redirected uh, and on the redirection, I also get the summer response, which is the sign response. And then once uh, the redirect is being done, then uh, the session is stored. The response now um, has been validated and stored on the session side on, on my application. And then when I'm, I'm, I'm calling hello, I get the 200 OK. So that's basically, yeah, exactly. So the authentication has been stored in the security context uh, in case of Spring Security. And now I, I, can, I can use it. So that's, that's basically how it works. And of course, everything relies on having a proper, uh, proper configuration, because if you, if you don't have a proper configuration, then it uh, won't basically work. So for example, if I say, uh, sign assertions off, and now I know that, uh, the response in this case will not be signed anymore. And I, I know that Spring Security at least doesn't allow that from, from what I recall. So I expect that if I put this on off now, I will, I will actually have an error instead. So let, let me restart my app again and try to see what happens if I, uh, I quit signing the, re the response. I most likely get, uh, get an exception. Uh, and that's even easier to see that uh, I'm being uh, uh, correctly redirected to Keycloak. Um, yeah, basically, basically that's it. Pretty easy, isn't it? So it's just a matter of a request response made through redirects. Uh, understand the fact that the messages are exchanged as XML encodings. Um, that in case of SAML, unlike the OAuth 2, uh, things uh, rely a lot on the sessions uh, on the server side session. Um, and yeah, not really sure what else exactly can I tell you about them. Basically trying to access it again and yeah, you can see it. So now I, I have a, a problem. Yeah. And I have a problem because it tells Spring Security tells me now you have the response and which is called an assertion in this case, one of the assertions, which is the response, uh, is unsigned. So it tells me I don't accept it. I need to have something that is properly signed with the key associated with that certificate you've given me, which is that certificate here. So if you don't have it signed, then it doesn't work. So that, that's what happens if you, um, if you have, have something wrong in the configuration, of course. So yeah, let's put it back here to work again. But basically that's it. And I see that I'm pretty okay. So I, I just, I've been very efficient with the time today and I've managed to not only explain you, I hope in enough detail how SAML works, compare it with OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect, but we also have seen an implementation and you ha we have used uh, Keycloak as an identity provider and uh, um, an our own implementation of an application with Spring and Spring Security, uh, which uh, hopefully make things clear. So I still have some questions to answer. Uh, if I am using a public key to check the signature of SAML token in Spring App itself, SAML token is SAML assertion. It's not really a token. There is no token in SAML actually. It's either the request or the response. So I'm not sure. I hope you are referring to a, the response or the request there. In Spring App itself to verify the token, will that be okay? Something like JW key set URI. So you are, what, what you are asking me is if there is some way in which you can uh, configure in Spring Security the public key through uh, a key URI, a certificate URI, 
instead of manually putting it there? And the answer, at least from what I recall now, is no. Uh, the only way I know to configure SAML is the way I've shown it to you now. I don't remember, but I might be wrong because I don't know all of it. Uh, so uh, don't, don't always trust me. But from what I know, uh, there is no such discoveries or self-discovery of the certificates uh, way, uh, at least in Spring Security. Um, and then we have, if the service provider has to manage uh, session on server side, then how they scale their application on multiple instances? Well, this is basically why uh, most likely today OAuth 2 is more and more used uh, rather than SAML and most likely why I had to drop the chapter in my Spring Security in action uh, because um, with today's microservices architectures, uh, you will most likely uh, find it uh, better for scalability to use the OAuth 2 rather than SAML. Uh, of course, there are solutions to use uh, server-side session as well, as we discussed in prior episodes, like for example, sticky sessions. But as you have observed, uh, it complicates the things a little bit. So again, that's most likely why you more and more see OpenID Connect and OAuth 2 rather than SAML being used today in applications. Cool. If those were all the questions and we've spent our time already uh, from what I see, uh, thank you very much again for being here with me. I hope you enjoyed again the session of today and hope to see you in the next session as well, where we will continue our software architecture fundamental series with a new nice subject you need to know. Thank you very much. And until then, have an excellent time for study further. Cheers.